Production funding provided by the Clark Janus Foundation, which supports educational programs for children and young adults. Seen that young boy, Chris, man. Nah, I haven't seen him by a minute. Yeah, he been in my age. Dog, I ain't seen him in like two weeks. Code switching is being able to move between variations of language in different situations or settings. In fact, everyone who speaks can and probably has code switched depending on the circumstance. Hey, hey girl, what's up? Not too much. Hello, how are you? Hi. Code switching can involve alternating between two different languages. For example, 11-year-old Erica Mojica speaks both Standard English and Tagalog, the Filipino language she's heard her parents speak since she was old enough to talk. They speak English, like to me, and they speak Tagalog like when they're with friends. Erica says she often switches when talking to friends who also know Tagalog. Alicadito, yeah, that means come over here and say, mabaho naman, and that means smells, like this place smells. While 10-year-old Shantanu Rastogi frequently switches from Hindi to mainstream English. When my like teacher would say, does anyone want water? And I'd accidentally say, Mujhe pani jaye, which means I want water. Mostly with my mother and father, I speak Hindi, but with my sister, she's not that great, great for, with Hindi, so I speak English with her. You can also code switch between two tonal registers. While your message may be the same, the tone in which it's delivered makes all the difference. For example, Please be quiet. draws a much different reaction than... Shut up! But one of the more common forms of code switching is a dialectical shift within the same language because while roughly 90% of Americans say they have no difficulty speaking English, we do not all speak the same version. There are scores of different dialects spoken right here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The two heard most often are Southern American English, y'all gotta go, and its cousin, African American Vernacular English, or Black English, also known as Ebonics. You ain't gotta go home, but you gotta get the heck out of here. You have to leave. For years, the latter, African American Vernacular English, or AAVE for short, has been the subject of controversy. It was thrown into the limelight in 1996 when the Oakland School Board proposed using Ebonics, a blend of the words ebony and phonics, as a way of teaching their students standard English. The board's resolution read, the superintendent, in conjunction with her staff, shall immediately devise and implement the best possible academic program for imparting instruction to African American students in their primary language for the combined purposes of maintaining the legitimacy and richness of such language and to facilitate their acquisition and mastery of English language skills. Oakland educators said they only wanted to recognize the language spoken by their African-American students and use that to teach them standard English. But what ensued were weeks of outrage and national debate over the use of black English. Some, like the Oakland School Board, argue that it should be used in the classroom as a means of teaching standard English to children who've only been exposed to AAVE, while others insist that it should never be used in any formal educational setting, and that it only disables African American children. That is not our debate. Our focus is on a person's ability to code switch between African American vernacular English and standard English, and how the inability to do so is impacting lives. So what's wrong with African American vernacular English? Most linguists will tell you nothing and lump it right in there with all of the other dialects. 
The problem is, most linguists don't run Fortune 500 companies. You see, most who speak standard English consider African American vernacular English a substandard dialect. And most who speak AAVE and are looking for economic and social mobility typically learn to code switch between the two. But lately, more and more people, young African Americans in particular, aren't switching, leaving them left out and left behind. According to the 2000 census, roughly 20% of Virginia's population is African American. The majority code switch between Black English and Standard English. I ain't know that. I didn't know that. How come you acting like you don't know now? Why are you pretending that you don't know what happened? Younger African Americans often incorporate more urban slang into the dialect than their elders. House in the hood. What's going on in the neighborhood? I mean, why are you jocking my style? Why are you copying me? Another distinct difference between African American vernacular English and Standard English is the use of verb tenses. He been done. He's finished. You crazy. You are very funny. Before you assume that those who use Black English or any form of informal English are too lazy or uneducated to speak Standard English, think again. Research shows that 80 to 90 percent of the African American population speak AAVE. Now, the amount in which it's spoken depends on the person, and so does where it's spoken. I'm from the Midwest. And there are a lot of euphemisms and a lot of colloquialisms that, that we speak at home. And then I say to my, my mother and my aunts, and we all understand each other, and I've actually talked to my daughter. But when we're in, on, in the professional field, we all speak um, standard English. And, and even now, I mean, I have, gosh, how many years of education? 10 years of education, and I recognize it, but I know still that I'm, I'm embodying my culture. I'm embodying where I was raised. So I might say, is you coming? <laughs> you know, like that. Um, and but you know, if I'm talking to a, another professional, or if I'm talking to you know at a you know you know job interview or in the classroom, I'll use professional English. My family, we're first generation college people. I grew up in the ghettos of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, for years, there was only one way that you really spoke. And, and those would be my formative years I'm talking about. And in living in the ghetto, you have to be able to speak like people in the ghetto. As I moved into middle school, you start appreciating um, different English and learning um, how to speak a different way. And all of us um, excelled in school. And so we learned really another language that was never used in our community. Um, and, and still in that community, um, in the ghettos of Richmond, still um, is not used um, that often. But it was really through the educational piece, uh, through the school system, that we learned um, the other language. But at the same time, it was always important that you're able to transition back, so that when you went back um, to your family and around your family, that you're able to speak in a way that, that they understand and appreciate. Because we did go through a period uh, where um, my family thought that we thought that we were better than them because we started uh, speaking differently. And, um, and it, was, it was a little eye-opening for us because it reminded us, look, this is still family, and so you need to be able to speak two ways. And, it, and so no one's offended, but you've got to be able to do, to do both. Michael Massey is an attorney who has also served as a substitute judge in Portsmouth. He says there were even times when he and his siblings were accused of speaking white, but they didn't allow that to steer them off course. My older brother is a lawyer. My sister is a correctional officer. He went to Virginia Military Institute. She went to Norfolk State. And um, I went to University of Virginia. And then there's the, the fourth child. Um, my younger brother didn't go to college. He's a lieutenant commander um, in the military. All of us completely speak um, very good English. But we were all together just last weekend at my mother's house. And all of my mother's sisters were there, and many, many of my first cousins were there. And um, you didn't hear a lot of good King's English. 
but we had a really good time. And that's how you have to be able to do it. Most told us they were taught to code switch by either watching their parents or being told by their parents not to speak a certain way in certain situations. Well, my mother is an assistant principal for Norfolk Public Schools. So it was like, before she was assistant principal, she was actually a literacy teacher. So uh, using the proper <laughs> grammar and proper English was always mandatory in our house. It was like, you can't use slang while you're indoors. When you're outside talking to your friends, that's cool. But there's also a different way to speak to people when you're out in the world. So it's just, like you said, code switching. Okay, well, you maybe try that next year. get the boys to do father always make sure, you know, whenever you're in front of an audience, speaking to someone of importance, you make sure you don't talk the same way that you're on your friends. So it was very, very important for him to make sure that we did that. I was fortunate enough to have a father who was a political official, military sergeant, who code switch, and I used to listen to him in church, I would listen to him at home, and I would listen to him speaking to the public. And I noticed there was different tones he would use in different dialects in different areas. And I understood that you speak a certain way in your community, and you speak a certain way professionally. While others, like Deitra Means, taught themselves. Um, they wouldn't so much correct me, they just wanted me to speak what they call proper English all the time. And what I did when I was with my friends, I guess I learned on my own how to switch it up. How when I'm at home around parents, around family, around the older people in my family, that I wasn't to speak the same way I spoke around my friends. Interestingly though, there's a growing number of African Americans who were raised code switching, but are choosing not to teach the art to their children. I was taught this code switch. That's namely why I don't want to teach them the same thing. I teach them to practice speaking the same way in, in every setting, at home, at school, at church. Um, just standard English, the way they're taught in school and at home, because I just want them to grow up speaking correct English and be articulate, be able to pronounce everything that they're trying to say with anybody, everybody, everywhere they go. It's funny because I have four children, and I spend about $60,000 educating those children a year. And, um, and they hear me talking like that sometimes, and they correct me. But I think it's cute. I'm like, you, know, you ought to be correcting me because I'm paying enough for you to be correcting me even though you're in fourth grade. And um, so they're not getting the benefit of the double language because um, they have been isolated um, with their education. And, um, and so they don't have that, they're not going to have that great, I call it that great benefit because there's nothing more relaxing and fun to be around your boys, your fraternity brothers or whatever and just just drop it all. And it's just, a, it's a cultural thing. You just feel like that you're able to just act black for a little while. And ain't nothing wrong with that. And there is a such thing as acting black. Because I do it almost every weekend. However, in most cases, those who learn to code switch have passed the skill on. When they're around their friends, if that's how they want to communicate with each other, that's fine. But they need to know how to leave it at school, on the playground. And when it's time to be professional, be professional. You need to speak properly, and especially speaking to adults and their elders. They need to speak properly. Don't, don't talk slang to them. Don't speak slang to them. I just think they need to understand that the world is bigger than just in their neighborhood and in their home, and they have to learn how to adapt and be a part of the bigger world. And so if in that bigger world, they speak differently, then you have to learn how to speak what's common for everybody and then know how to adapt when you're in other environments to speak to what's common in that environment. So you have to be able to do both. So I'm very excited. I find myself doing a lot of different things in this classroom um, just to show them how to speak in a certain way. At the same time, I can trans, you know, speak the same way that they speak at home and then switch it you know, to make sure this is how we do it in the classroom. But what happens when someone doesn't know how to code switch and the socially preferred form of English, the standard most used by the powerful and affluent, is not learned? Keontre Rogers knows firsthand. I, I went on a job interview and I, I slipped up and said the wrong word to, to, the, to the manager over there. And he was like, I don't have poor interview skills. Off of one word, when he asked me a question, I just said, uh huh. That was the response I gave him. I guess he didn't like it. So he was just like, I have poor interview skills. 
Since that experience, Keontre has been working to get his GED and now knows exactly what his response during the interview should have been. I should have responded with a yes, sir. Nicole Newby remembers watching a college classmate struggle during an oral presentation. We were giving presentations called Teach Backs where we had to teach the class a subject that we already learned in the class and he was supposed to teach women's suffrage and uh, he was talking like he was talking to his friends because you know he, he was saying uh, yo the women did this and blah 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 and uh, yeah you know it was he was about to <laughs> call him the b-word but he stopped himself at least with that but uh, he didn't know how to talk because the teacher was like uh, what are you doing? He st she stopped him and was like, S talk like the way you, you're talking, you're trying to get a job interview. Don't talk like you're talking to your homeboys because you're giving a presentation. And she was like, talk like you're giving a presentation at least. And he said, I can't. And she said, what are you talking about? You can't. And he's like, I just can't. And she said, okay, you know what, go sit down. And of course she gave him an F for the class. African-American vernacular English is considered a cousin or stepchild of Southern American English because of how it originated. Slaves captured in Africa and brought to the South spoke whatever language or dialect was spoken in their village, town, or state. There were then, and still are today, thousands of languages spoken on the continent of Africa, accompanied by thousands of different dialects. But the enslaved Africans eventually picked up English in order to communicate with their owners and one another. The majority of these enslaved Africans and their descendants lost most of their language and culture. Well, I think the basis of language is out of the African Americans' control based on history. During the mid-Atlantic slave trade, the English colonies when the slaves were bought in, decided to change the names of Africans so that they would be able to pronounce them. The English language is broken because we have these people that had no control over a language decide to change the names of our African culture. And so when all of us, who are all from different places, come together and speak, there is a slight difference in all of our language and that is out of our control based on history and the placement of African Americans in the states. Some enslaved Africans kept words from their native language that were used, understood, and passed on to the next generation. A few even made it into the English language in one form or another. You had uh, some terms coming from Nigeria, specifically from the Hausa region, which was northern Nigeria, and from the area, you know, where you had the Igbo and the Yoruba, which is the southern part of Nigeria, where the largest numbers of African Americans uh, can trace their heritage. There was a word called goy. It had the same meaning as guy, as person. You had uh, yake. And if you say yake, yake, which means all right, which means okay. And there's not an English word that is okay, O-K-A-Y, or the abbreviation of okay. That means all right. But yake is very, very similar and has exactly the same meaning. And when you had large numbers of Africans, especially from Nigeria, coming into this country, the latter part of the 18th century, um, that's when you started to see some of the, the slang words being used and of course coming from the south and then going into the north at the time when it seems like it, it really captured the imagination of the nation because it went along with the Great Migration. Some linguists believe African American vernacular English can be traced back to slaves picking up different dialects of English they heard spoken in the British Isles and mixing in words from their native languages. For example, in several West African languages, the word K means yes. K, Master, you just leave me sit here. 
Still others say AAVE originates from an English-based Creole language that spread throughout plantations in the South, allowing slaves to communicate with one another. Some of the traits of this Creole language include an absence of linking verbs and suffixes. Next thing you know, the couple way. Linguists can't seem to nail down which origin is more likely, only that the language traveled with those who spoke it as they eventually migrated north and west. But in the 20th century, AAVE is seen as a means of identification and has become more ethnically distinct than ever before. I have two experiences in a class. I kind of feel like the professor would use words that were unnecessary mm -hmm. because I'm like, you could have said that in another too. way mm -hmm. and we still would have understood. Like, I just felt like she was doing extra. Extra, everybody knows me, can I have some more? Mm -hmm. But that's not in the sense the way she was using it. So the context of words with slang changes by region and by culture. Mm -hmm. I'm from the South. We don't use extra. We just may say, she doing too much. And even with that, being from the South, we run our words together. So growing up and moving to Virginia, I had to learn how to slow my words down in my speaking. Because when we talk back home, you will put like three or four words all together. And if you're not from that area, you'll be like, what did she just say? <laughs> AAVE's usage and acceptance has spread through many mediums, for example, in literature. In the 1922 poem Mother to Son, renowned poet Langston Hughes writes, Life for me ain't been no crystal stare. By the mid-1930s, African-American vernacular English had made its way to Broadway in plays like Porgy and Bess. And again, in the 1959 play, A Raisin in the Sun. I just see my family falling apart today just falling apart in pieces in front of my eyes. We couldn't have gone on like we was today. We was going backwards instead of forwards, talking about killing babies and witching each other was dead. But nothing has spread the usage and acceptance of AAVE faster than the internet, television, and music. This has enabled African-American vernacular English to stretch much further than the African-American community. It's become increasingly noticeable that music is a big influence on our lives. Uh, it affects the way that we talk, the way that we think, the way that we write, and it's generally not in a good way. Pretty boy take off in five, four, three, two, one. This right here is my sweat. Well, with my daughter, I think one time she responded to me, she said, that was whack what you did. I'm like, what did you say? And I'm like, that was whack. I said, is that how you talk to an adult? And she was like, that's just, I'm just saying it, it's not bad. I'm like, yeah, well, listen to what you just said. That's whack. And she was like, well, I didn't mean it in a uh, bad way. I just said it. I'm like, but where did you get that from? And I said, have you ever heard me talk like that? And she was like, no. I'm like, so where did you get that from? I don't know. So it's either come from um, the music she's hearing on TV, up with the videos, or her peers in school or somewhere. And don't keep calling from your mama house when I break up with my face, boy. Up on my face, boy. Up on my face, boy. Up on my face, boy. Don't buy no drinks at the bar. Pop champagne, cause we got that dough. Let me hear you say. Language, like food, like clothing, embodies culture. 
And they're proud to be able to communicate and to speak um, in a certain slang and to be able to adapt uh, the language as it changes. There's a sense of I'm embodying my culture at this time, wherever I am regionally. Um, there's a sense of you understand me, I understand you. Particularly if we're speaking specifically about African Americans, Hispanic Americans who now use um, a lot of black English. If we're talking about them, they're like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm able to communicate with young people, with people in the hip hop generation. I'm able to communicate with anyone who's on my level and the hierarchy cannot penetrate what we're doing. So that's one level. Academically, what's really interesting, Henry Louis Gates Jr. wrote a book. One of the elements of Signifying Monkey says that slang or black slang came from slaves subverting meaning, subverting language so the master wouldn't understand them. And so there are so many different um, reasons why young people want to keep that. Um, and then there are so many reasons why they, they need to understand that there is a, a time and a place to speak slang. I be on the hotline like every day, making sure that DJ know what I want. I think that code switching has so much more to do with um, just language. I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes with identity and how you see yourself and how others see you. So I think that it's a coping mechanism in a way to maintain um, relatability among people who are your peers and who are like you, but also to progress in this mainstream society, in this mainstream world. Norfolk State University students Eric Hellams III and Latifa Lanclos both understand the importance of code switching and each believes they know why a growing number of their peers aren't switching. So everybody now like so confident, like, oh yeah, I'm black, I can speak how I want to speak, whoever, I don't care if you're wearing a suit or not, I can speak whoever I want to speak, because like, they're so confident in how they speak, but they don't know sometimes that you have to turn it off and turn it on. Eric sees things a little differently. He sees young people growing up in communities and homes where mainstream English isn't spoken and too many schools focusing on writing and paying very little attention to how you speak. I believe that young African Americans are used to hearing the slang terms and being brought up that way within the families and then you have a lot of teachers that don't correct them and so that's getting them comfortable and getting them used to saying it a lot so that's why they continue to use it as they get older. 18-year-old Kendrick Brown agrees. The teachers, I don't believe that they really take the time out to really help the kids anymore. I see that it's a job, everyone needs the money. So hey, I'm going to teach the little boy how to do something. Matter of fact, I may not even teach the boy. I know the boy is struggling, but I'm not going to give him one-on-one -on -one help. And I see he's struggling, maybe he asks his mom. His mom's not there to help. Who's there to help? And the teacher say, oh, I'm making the money, so let him pass. I don't have to see his face next year. So we can't put it all on the teachers. You have to want to know, want to learn. And I think with that willingness to want to get what it is the teacher is teaching, you're going to get it. That's what the kids of today have to, have to realize. If the teacher's teaching, take it home. Take home what you've learned and go over it constantly. That's the only way you're going to grasp it. My mother, she didn't finish school. So it was kind of like, I didn't learn the proper English then. But like the rest of her classmates studying to get their GEDs, Carolyn Barnes is well aware that learning standard English is key to career advancement and a better life. It's, you have to learn it because you're not going to get far. You're not going to be able to get the big jobs or all that. You're not even going to be able to get a little job if you don't know standard English. It's a message that Denise Ryan and Gilbert Bynum hope to get across to everyone who comes to their literacy services program. You can use it with your friends, but when you're in a professional setting, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It won't work at all. So they have to know when to use correct English, standard English, and when to use the, the slang. Well, like when I first came here, I used to always say I ain't got 
it, so I ain't got that. But now, I don't feel it because it's raining, so make sure I don't feel it. <laughs> While Denise Ryan's group wants to learn mainstream English so they can effectively code switch, there are others who fear they're being stripped of their identity if they have to speak a certain way in order to be accepted or advance in their careers. I feel like as a community, like as, as people in general, we all have something special about the way we speak and who is anyone to look down on you for that? Yo, cuz, come here. What's good, son? What are they doing today as they try to tell the world? There's a deeper issue of, you know, do people want to assimilate or not, or keep their own cultural background? And so, some, I know one of the issues is that you know people in the in the schools, who are speaking African American vernacular, don't want to assimilate to the broader society in many cases, and that becomes a real issue. So that if they speak so-called standard English. They're, um, people have the feeling that they have to give up one language to get another language. Mm -hmm. That's because of the negative attitudes. The negative attitudes. On yeah. the part of the teachers and, and other people. That there's something wrong with these varieties that don't have prestige. Right. As opposed to just seeing them as different functional varieties. People kind of knee-jerk. Varieties of African American English or Black English, also Southern English and certain varieties of New York English, these, these varieties are, are stigmatized. Whereas if somebody walked in a classroom who walks in with a, uh, speaking a dialect of British English, you know, all the American English speakers think what? Oh, that oh, person's so really smart. smart, they're rich, they're something. They're, you know. So even though it's just a different variety, that is, British yeah. English, African American Englishes, Southern Englishes, these come with uh, negative values. If African American people in this country sat on all the boards, the corporate boards, and uh, the university boards, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, guess what would be standard? Some variety of African American English. But since that's not the case, the real world awaits. Remember Michael Massey, who, in his words, grew up in the ghettos of Richmond? Michael describes his ability to code switch from Black English to Standard English this way. I tell you what I do mostly around my friends that I don't, I don't do uh, when I'm speaking in code and when I'm speaking to people generally. Um, I use double negatives a lot um, when I'm speaking with my, with my boys and my fraternity brothers when I'm playing cards, like playing bid whist, um, as I did yesterday after I got out of church, played for about five hours. Um, a lot of double negatives. Um, a lot of kind of um, ebonics. Um, embarrassing to say once in a while, you know, I use the N word. You know, it, I'm just telling you the truth. You know, I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Um, and um, so, any form of slang, ain't is a big, I use ain't a lot. Good morning, Judge. Can we have but Michael is quick to point out that when he's in court, he never even thinks about using any form of African American vernacular English. Never. Speaking correctly is very important to me. And uh, there's no slipping, no. Mm -mm. I've never said ain't in court. <laughs> and the same rules apply in his office. Well, anyone that works here has to be able to communicate effectively um, with people because the first connection that I make with people is really not through me personally. It's typically through my staff members because they answer the telephones. And so um, their ability to speak well and communicate is important because they set up all of my appointments. Many of my appointments are first time people who don't know me may have heard about me. And so it's important that whoever answers the phone is able to communicate effectively uh, with the potential client. Quite pointedly, you know, you're not going to walk into Bank of America, SunTrust, and think you're going to get a professional position and you can't speak. It's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. If you can't effectively communicate with people, you're not going to work in here either. And I'm not Bank of America. I'm small law firm me. 
Michael Massey is not alone. Please have a seat. Most business owners will tell you that what they're looking for when it comes to hiring employees is a person who can speak mainstream English. Various internships in diverse places. Well, I think in any business, your receptionist, for example, is a person that makes a first impression on your clients or your customers. I happen to be a lawyer, so we talk about clients, and, but they're really our customers. And we want the person that greets them at the front desk when they get off the elevator and come into our office to be an articulate person, easily understood, and who speaks pretty much the same language and the same idiom, the same accents as our clients generally do. Now, clients are uh, business people, professional people, educators uh, from all ranks of life, but mainly they do speak standard English and they expect to be greeted by someone who speaks the same way. I think that's a habit some people have gotten and I think they can relearn. And I'm referring to people that come in and speak with slang expressions, um, uh, foul language, uh, gutter talk, street talk, uh, your nose, your nose, your nose. That sort of thing, one can learn not to do that. And while we don't sense them for it, we are looking for someone in our firm who can, we hope, speak standard English. I have a certain job description. They have to speak on the telephone and be understood. They have to receive people in this office and make them feel comfortable. So I've never, uh, if I have a choice between someone who really fills the bill and someone who does not, I'm a businesswoman. I have to do what's the best for the company. Show me what you got, little mama. Show me what you got, bird lady. Show me what you got, sorry. Even artists who speak black English understand the importance of switching things up depending on the situation. In a March 2007 article written by the staff at Men's Flare magazine, hip-hop artist Jay-Z is described this way. He knows that to be taken seriously in the corporate world, he has to present a sophisticated, take-charge image. Jay-Z moves in and out of many different circles and recently told Men's Health magazine that sometimes stereotypes rear their ugly head. He said, quote, it's hilarious a lot of times. You have a conversation with someone and he's like, you speak so well. I'm like, what do you mean? Do you understand? That's an insult. I'm the new Sinatra, and since I made it here, I can make it anywhere. Yeah, they love me everywhere. I used to but the rapper and successful businessman with a net worth of about $150 million isn't letting that slow him down. And neither are the students at an Achievable Dream Academy in Newport News, where standard English has another name, Speaking Green. Here, the green isn't about being environmentally friendly. It's about your ability to earn the almighty dollar. Uh, it's okay to speak slang. It's okay to talk with your friends in whatever, you know, in the way you communicate effectively with your friends. We don't want you to be uh, isolated and made fun of, so you do what you have to do in your community, in your neighborhood, in your home. But when you're in school, in a public place, if you're preparing yourself for a job interview, um, we expect you to speak green. And one of the things we had to do in this building was provide the, the Speaking Green uh, training program for our teachers a couple of years ago so that they understood what the expectations were and the expectations of the kids. And we don't want a, a, an adult to sort of get in the kid's face and, and remind them what they're not doing. What we really expect our adults and parents, our parents and but mostly teachers and staff members in, in both buildings is to just remind the kids. What I found happening very often when a kid says, I ain't going to do that, I'll say, excuse me, or raise my eyebrows, and they quickly go back to speaking proper business English. And, and that's all we wanted our teachers to do. To, you, you can correct them by raising your eyebrows. You can correct them by actually uh, asking them to please repeat that. Or you can correct them by just simply saying, uh, excuse me, and, and they knew what to do. And that, that's part of the culture starting in third grade. So certainly by the time they get to this building, uh, they, they know what the expectations are. 
Speaking green is the language of money to me. If you can speak green, then you can go out into this world well equipped to get almost any job that you're fully qualified for. If you speak green, then you get the money. Speaking green is all about business. It's all about knowing how to talk to others at different situations. These students are well aware of when and how to code switch. When I'm at home with my friends, I do not use that at all. It's me and my friends, so I always really talk how we slang, as you can say. One phrase I do say all the time, I say that's whack. And um, I wouldn't use it here because maybe if I said that, other people, like, people that's not of my generation wouldn't understand what that's whack is. When I'm not here, I usually say the first thing that comes to mind. And it's generally not speaking green, but uh, to be able to switch between speaking green is the ability that I've gained to achievable dream. An achievable dream isn't the only school where students are educated in the importance of code switching. At Junior Academy, Norfolk Public School's Summer Enrichment Program for Academic Achievers, they place a great deal of emphasis on speech. We all judge people, one, by first impression. So if the first impression you have of somebody is, is that their language skills are not good, you're going to automatically, I think, jump to the conclusion that perhaps their cognitive and intellectual skills aren't great either. So it creates a barrier. I know enough of public schools that with our students, no matter what level we're on and not, no matter what our job is, we make a real effort to use language correctly and model it because modeling is one of the ways that children learn language. When I work with the kids in, in the program that I'm in now especially and we talk about college and we talk about career, one of the things we talk about is language. You know, how you present yourself. They all have to do a presentation and part of that is this because they have to get that practice to be able to get up and speak and speak correctly to an audience. We often have conversations and say how you speak with your peers is how you speak with your peers, but how you speak with adults or how you speak when you are in a more professional setting is different and you have to understand what that difference is. And so the ones who get that you don't worry about. The ones who don't get it are the ones who really need the help to understand the difference. The teachers at Norfolk's Dream Keepers Academy spend a great deal of time making sure their students are well-rounded. And a big part of that is making sure they can code switch. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, where fought thy Romeo? Code switching is one of the things we do here, one of the initiatives we have in place here at Dream Keepers because we know we're competing with music and a lot of our kids in today's society love rap music and we know uh, rap, most of your rap musicians are multimillionaires. So you can't say, you know, speaking that way will not get you anywhere because you're contradicting what they see and hear. But what we want to let them know that there is a professional way of speaking. So we take the rap sounds here change the lyrics into a professional speaking way to make it fun for children. We also have a professional dress day where we teach children how to prepare to go to job interviews. The first time we implemented professional dress, we had kids to come in throwback jerseys, brand new jeans, and who actually thought that was professional dress. So those are things we teach children, how to wear suits, how to wear dresses to be prepared and that first impression making a difference on the person who wants to employ you. How do you speak properly? There is nothing wrong with your culture. We're not trying to change your culture, but we want to let, let you know that there's two ways of communicating. Everyone does not listen to rap music, country music, rock music, but everyone speaks standard English, and you have to be prepared to do that. On any given day, they can go from um, speaking you know, regular English, the neighborhood English, speaking Shakespeare, 
into doing um I can take it back to African American history style in the old you know that way. So they have they played different roles. Shall I hear more or shall I speak at this? Tis but thy name that tis my enemy. Thou art thyself. Art thou not to Montague? If you get to know the child and then once you get to know them, they feel comfortable with you, you can pretty much coach them to doing whatever, you know, being successful, whatever you want them to do. Just do it in a way that it's, it doesn't hurt their feelings or bring any, any you know, not really noticeable to like um, to a point that they, they feel it all. And Mr. Williams, why are you telling me to speak that way? So if I if I show them how to do it, it's easy for them to understand, and they just you know mimic me the way I do it. The mission continues in the Career Services Department at Norfolk State University. Here, they pay close attention to how students speak in an effort to make sure they put their best foot forward when they're ready to look for a job. We teach students how to prepare for the interview. Uh, we emphasize in that process that students should enunciate well, they should speak well, and speak standard English. No slang, no street language, and we emphasize that during the process. We emphasize the appropriate uh, language, the appropriate uh, style that we want them to use during the interviewing process because as you very well know with the economy the way it is, it is highly competitive and we don't want that to be an issue with our students here at Norfolk State University. Montgomery also believes that public speaking courses on both the high school and college level are opportunities to address how young people speak and to assist with correction. If you are passionate about what you believe in, then the satisfaction lies in making your position known and having others ponder what you think. Michael Massey agrees. My oldest two children have already taken public speaking. I took public speaking for the first time at UVA. Um, they've already taken a public speaking course. Um, I think it was in seventh grade that they took it. And so that component um, is needed, but there are other resources that you can get that same thing without having a formal public speaking course. You have to be willing to, to, to be honest with our children if you want to help our children. And that means telling our children very early on, no, you're not going to be a professional football player. No, you're not going to be a professional basketball player. You know, the chances of that happening, it's just de minimis. And so we're going to put our emphasis in books. Black people still have a little problem, to, a problem with that. Black middle class children are not able to exceed the economic status of their parents like white children, white middle class children are. White middle class children far exceed um, the economics that their parents have, but the black middle class isn't able to do that. I said one of the reasons is that we give our children so much because we didn't have it, but then we're not teaching them on how you earned it and what it took for you to earn this. You know, that, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, if I'm in a household and I'm making, my wife and I are making, you know, $400,000, $450,000 a year, you know, my children should be in a household. Um, my children will be in a household making a million dollars or more a year because that's what we're teaching in my house. But parents aren't teaching that for some reason. They're not teaching, they want to give them, give them, give them but not teach them the value of earning that money and, and doing well so that you can put yourself in a position to earn. A lot of my friends, we get very, very... Oh, I think that sometimes we've gotten to the point with um, um, young people that we don't want to correct them. You know, you think, oh, why well, I shouldn't... But the only way they're going to learn it is to be modeled it, to, for someone to model it, and for them to be corrected to use it because you're right, when you go off to do a job, you're going to be judged on that. Most we spoke with believe the quickest way for anyone to put themselves in a position to earn is through education. And if they are successfully communicating with their family and their friends, then what they're speaking, the dialect or form of English that they're using, is fine for that. But they need another form of English to be successful in certain careers in life, and many of those careers or careers that they are fit for and can be uh, successful in if they can speak standard English. If they can't speak standard English, they won't be eligible for those particular careers. We see the uh, leading companies in the United States either led by uh, African Americans who speak standard English or 
certainly have uh, in high among their ranks, in the legal departments, wherever, um, people of that distinction, sometimes on the board of directors. And th th those opportunities exist, but children who can't speak standard English or handicapped, well, those opportunities are not going to be open to them. Uh, I think it depends on people's goals. A young person starting out today, what is his goal? What kind of job does he want? And he could do a lot of things that would move him to a better position to get that job without changing everything he does. Because it's to their advantage. Why would they do it? Would they do it for me? No. Would they do it for you? What's the advantage of that? How about doing it for themselves? It's like almost going to college and taking a college course and improving yourself. The ones who improve themselves stand out like a sore thumb. They have joy and when they come into your office and want a job, you want to find a place for them because it's so enchanting. They have ambition and enthusiasm and excitement. But something has to happen to you that you have a little light on and say, I think if I did thus, that it would be a big boost for me. Not anybody else, but me. CNU professor and linguist Dr. Rebecca Wheeler, the co-author of several books on code switching, speaks to the teachers. She says, quote, by putting away the red pen and providing structured instruction in code switching, teachers can help urban African-American students use language more effectively. Her co-author, Rachel Swords, is a literary specialist who teaches at an urban elementary school in Newport News. Swords says, quote, the children know there's a different way of speaking. They just don't know how to get there. She goes on to say, with code switching, there's a context to get it, taking what they know and building on it. But what happens if the person isn't a child? Experts are quick to point out that learning to communicate better doesn't have to be within the confines of a classroom. In your spare time, pick up a dictionary. Pick up a dictionary and just go through it. That enhances, increases your vocabulary. Read. Read when you're, when you're home, in your spare time. Mm -hmm. Turn the soap opera off. Turn BET off. Mm -hmm. Get a book, a magazine, and read. But I just think that everybody should be able to speak standard English. You know, when you want to communicate effectively, verbally and in written form. You need to utilize your prepositions well. So there's, you know, a way to use above and below and, you know, beyond and at. The preposition is, is a way that you can strengthen your language if you want to. Some of them will take it and some of them won't. Some of them will stay where they are and some of them will interview the way they interview and they'll get the jobs that they get, which is unfortunate. And others will take it and they'll say, you know what, I know I need to communicate better. And so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and get into this grammar book. I'm going to try to write better. I'm going to try to utilize. I'm going to try to learn the language that I wasn't born into. Life is totally about choices. The choice to, to use proper English, the choice not to. The choice to get a job or, or get a profession. Um, to do something I want to do or something I don't care to do for the rest of my life. It's a personal choice that one must, must take and say, I want better for myself. I want better for my life. I want better for my children. I want better for. I want a better outlook on life, a better future. Um, it's a choice. Did you enjoy yourself? I did. Did you? Oh, I had a good time. Absolutely. Many of us code switch so frequently, we aren't even aware that we're switching back and forth. It's simply instilled in us as a way to successfully survive. We dissect it as an important social function, necessary for anyone who longs to advance economically, but who finds a great deal of pleasure engaging in the language or dialect of family and friends. In the end, code switching seemingly boils down to economics and the tools it takes in this society to achieve success. Some will grab those tools immediately. Others will lose a few along the way, but eventually recover exactly what they need to reach their goal. 
and the remainder? Those who choose not to code switch may find a rocky road lined with closed doors of opportunity. And if they decide to venture out of their comfort zone and attempt to open a closed door, they may have to answer this question. Can you code switch? Production funding provided by the Clark Janus Foundation, which supports educational programs for children and young adults.